The New York Giants open the 2024 season against the Minnesota Vikings. How close is quarterback J.J. McCarthy to being ready? Plus, should the Giants mark this one as a automatic W? We hear from Locked On Vikings host Luke Braun, whose feedback might just bring a smile or two to Giant fans' faces. That's coming your way next on the Locked On Giants podcast. You are Locked On Giants, your daily New York Giants podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of the Locked On Giants podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the promo code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Hello, New York Giant fans, and welcome to another edition of the Locked On Giants podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast family. Your team every day. My name is Patricia Trena, credential member of the New York Giants media for Locked On as well as for Giants on SI. Find my written work at si.com slash NFL slash Giants. And welcome on in to my Blue Crew community members, my everydayers, my newcomers, and everybody in between. Thank you so much for spending part of your day with us here on the Locked on Giants podcast. And on today's show, we're continuing our look at the New York Giants 2024 regular season opponents. I know we're going out of order a little bit here, but uh, we're going to swing over to our week one opponent, the Minnesota Vikings, and joining me to break down the Minnesota Vikings, all the key storylines, the personnel changes, and what we might expect in week one is Luke Braun. He is the host of Locked On Vikings. Luke, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Pat, always a pleasure. Yeah, good to see you, my friend. I hope your summer's going well. Okay, so I think we've got to start off with one of the big storylines. Uh, Kirk Cousins, of course, went to Atlanta. The Vikings have signed uh, Sam Darnold, who's kind of been bouncing around a little bit. Mm -hmm. They drafted J.J. McCarthy. It sounds like coming out of um, the, the recently complete, completed OTAs and whatnot, it sounds like Darnold is the guy. But can you give us an update on where the quarterback situation currently stands? Yeah, Darnold should be the guy for week one. Um, they're leaving it open for something cool to happen in camp. If J.J. McCarthy really, like, you know, his wheels hit the ground and, and, and he goes in, then then they'll start him. But I, for you guys, for week one, I would expect Sam Darnold. If you're playing the Vikings week 14, it's more of a question. But, uh, yeah, that, that'll, that'll be the move. McCarthy will probably be running with the threes all of camp. They're retooling his mechanics. They're, you know, getting him to learn all of the new timings. There's a lot of little nuanced stuff and new habits that they want him to build. And it's really not feasible to build those if you're also, like, trying to prepare for the Giants. So just be on the third team, go hang out with the scout team, work on your stuff. You know, he's in the incubator and nobody should think about him until he's in. But yeah, it'll be Darnold returning to MetLife, baby. Okay, so question then. Darnold has taken a beating over his career. He's kind of, oh, like yeah. I said, he's kind of bounced around. Um, I don't know, you know, how much you've been able to see of him in the OTAs and whatnot, but is he, you know, I don't want to say renovated. I don't think that's the right word, but does he look Re rehabilitated? Like yeah, that's that's the word I wanted. Did, did we fix the bozo gene? Look, if anybody fixed the bozo gene, it would have been Shanahan last year. Um, and and he did play one game week eighteen. They rested all their starters, so he played. He looked pretty good in that game. So that's kind of all we have to go on. So I guess there's a reason for optimism there. But to be honest with you, nobody in Minnesota cares. <laughs> we know he's only in for six weeks. Like it, whatever happens, happens. It's fine. <laughs> uh, like Vikings fans are fine. We know it's gonna be you know. We're going to have some turnovers. We're going to have some Bozo stuff. We're going to have some cool athletic plays. It should be pretty fun to watch. It's not going to be 6-0. and It's fine. Uh, we're, we're all holding our breath and waiting for the day when J.J. McCarthy takes over for him or whatever. We just need him to not be so catastrophically bad that you don't have a choice but to try the rookie before he's ready just to give the team a spark. That's kind of the way that rookies get ruined. So he just has to like beat that threshold, which is a pretty low bar. Um, so my, my te expectations are very, very tempered for Sam Darnold. He's going to be the 28th best quarterback in the league. We know he's just here to keep the seat warm while the rookie gets ready. Now it's interesting because the Vikings hired Josh McCone to be the new mm -hmm. quarterback's coach. 
um, former NFL quarterback. I think he was in the league for 18 years, you know, journeyman. Yeah. Former teammate of Sam Darnold. Yeah. Yeah. Former teammate of Sam Darnold. I mean, how much, how much of a factor has that been? And is that an advantage, do you think, you know, in, in helping rehabilitate Sam Darnold? So it was a big factor before the draft in how into Drake May the Vikings were because he was, Josh McCown coached with Drake May when Drake May was in high school. So they were like very close. And I'm going to guess he was a big driving force in the Vikings trying really, really, really hard to get up to that, you know, third, fourth pick to try to get uh, Drake May. That didn't happen. Patriots said, we're going to take him. Okay, fair enough. Uh, they all really like JJ McCarthy plenty as well. Um, and now McCown is basically going from trying things out with a highly drafted rookie quarterback in his first year as Carolina's quarterbacks coach that did not go well at all for a whole bunch of reasons. Hard to determine how much of that was Josh McCown's fault or wasn't, but now he's here and he's kind of doing the same thing. Um, but Knowing Sam Darnold as well and helping Sam Darnold, you know, a, a wily veteran with all of that experience who can help Darnold kind of work through. McCown has had plenty of his own, you know, three interception games that he can kind of say, OK, you know, here's how you you threw a pick. Here's how you move past it, that kind of stuff. Um, but I would also say that O'Connell, as a quarterback's guy himself, it's still O'Connell's world. He's still the one setting the tone and setting, okay, here's what we want you to do. Here's the plan. Here's all the stuff we want you to get better at. And when you're better at it, you know, you're in. Um, He's the one deciding that there's not really a deadline on that. That's not, we're not trying to get you in by week six. We're getting you in when you are, when we're comfortable with how you know all this other stuff that we're getting into, these these nitty gritty details. You know, we're putting you in when we feel you are ready. Uh, That's that's O'Connell. So really the tone is set by the head coach. And um, McCown is working with Mullins and Jaron Hall and as at QB4 and Darnold as much as he's working with McCarthy. Uh, but, you know, it's it's an all-hands-on-deck situation, obviously. There's nothing more important than your young quarterback. You mentioned, um, you know, the quarterback being important. But another guy who was kind of important was Justin Jefferson. There was some... Oh, a little. Touch and go. <laughs> yeah, a little touch and go there as to whether or not he would be back, whether they would trade him. There was actually, I don't know, I'm sure you saw the report that, you know, they were actually trying to move ahead of the Giants because they had their eyes on the yeah. neighbors. I mean, you know. And at I, the I have a theory he, on that. I think okay, someone yeah. fr- I think someone from your side lied to Mike Florio when he took the bait. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think somebody told Florio, oh, yeah, the Giants are trying to trade up. Someone should try to trade up because they wanted uh, – I think they wanted Marvin Harrison to be pushed down the board. So ah. they were trying to get something there. That's my theory on that. It, it Also, all of the Vikings local beat, um, the reputable Vikings beat, uh, all came out and said that that was a false report. So I think that that was draft smoke that okay. kind of came out after the fact and then felt a little more – a little bit. Well, all I know is I didn't float that to Florio because you know I, I, <laughs> it wasn't I, you. Okay. <laughs> no, it wasn't me. I mean, if anything, I was I was running with the trade up to get Drake May uh, crowd because sure. that that was making its way around. But anyway, just you That's know, getting back, about, just yeah. getting back to Jefferson. Obviously, they worked everything out, but you know, did they really work things out? Because oh, yeah. you know, it it, it it sounded like it came down to you know one side wearing out the other and. Is Jefferson now set, or do you think there's still a possibility they could look to move him? So there's a lot there. Um, I, I think the the media, in an attempt to make it a story that they could run a bunch of times in the summer when there's nothing else going on, made that contract negotiation seem a lot more contentious than it ever was. Really, they tried to get it done a year early, and Jefferson will readily say, like, I know that's abnormal because I'm special. We tried to get it done early. And then ultimately, this is the way Schefter put it, ultimately said, I think I get more money if I wait a year, which is true. He did. Uh, He got hurt, but luckily not severely enough to affect a contract negotiation. Um, And he got everything his side wanted. His side got to say the most guaranteed at signing ever for a non-quarterback, the most ever for a wide receiver. He got all the milestones that he and his agent wanted. The Vikings paid it out. Um, which tells me that the Vikings were never going to have an issue with all the big demands that Justin Jefferson. Yeah, we're going to pay you. Of course, you earned your money. Go ahead. We love you. Yes. Uh, and really what, what it got people so worked up was the timeline. They tried to get it done right before the season. 
The season was about to start. They said, let's table this. Let's focus on football. We'll come back to it. Everybody was fine with that. Justin Jefferson was fine with that. His agent was fine with that. The Vikings were fine with that. Vikings media really wanted you to think someone wasn't fine with that because otherwise they would have nothing to say. Uh, I got really upset about this on lockdown. I got really annoyed by this on lockdown Vikings because it was very clear that everything was fine. Okay, yeah, we'll we'll pick it up next June. And then that's what they did. And it took them like a week. (laughs) Simple enough, right? We just we just had to wait and marinate on it for a year, and everybody got really annoying about that because they felt like they they had to speak on it. Yeah, but what about Jordan Addison? I mean, this is a guy who you know, according to reports coming out of the Vikings OTAs, who came back into to you know from the off season, looked really good, looked like he bulked up a little bit, looked stronger, just really you know opened a few eyes. I mean, how does he kind of fit in? And do you see him maybe? sharing some of the, the load with Jefferson or how do you kind of see the receiver uh, distribution, the pass distribution to the receivers kind of playing out? It, he's going to be very important, especially with TJ Hawkinson on probably pup or IR to start the season. So you guys won't see Hawkinson this year. Um, he's the subversion to Justin Jefferson. So Justin Jefferson draws more doubles than anybody. He is drawing Randy Moss level of double teams. Tyree kill second place, like, Doubled about a third of the time. And when I say doubled, I'm not talking about the Calvin Johnson, two guys in press coverage. I'm talking brackets and the way that teams actually assign two players to one receiver. Uh, Nobody gets doubled more than Justin Jefferson. Tyreek Hill is second place about a third of the time. or I'm sorry, about uh, 20% of the time, I think. There's an article at Wide Left from Arif Hassan, who covers the Vikings, uh, about Justin Jefferson's thing. Jefferson gets doubled a third of the time, 33% of the time. That is obscene. That is absolutely insane. Uh, And if you have one player taking that much attention that often, a deep threat that can hit a post on the backside for a touchdown and punish that, that's why they spent a first-round pick on Jordan Addison. Um, That needs to be a part of the offense for this to work. And in fact, uh, maybe the best example of this phenomenon was with Hawkinson in 2022, for both the Giants games, the, the regular season and the playoff game, Hawkinson went over 100 yards in both of those games, and the offense rolled in both of those games against the Giants because the Giants committed a lot of resources to stopping Justin Jefferson and did slow him down, but the offense was still able to move. Now, in the playoffs, if the defense could have gotten its crap together, maybe there would have been a different story, but that's that's the thesis. If you want, a, like a, that's actually the example I always point to is that, that whiteout Christmas Eve game against the Giants. It's like, this is how it's supposed to look when Justin Jefferson Jefferson isn't on. All right, Jack Pants, you're listening to the Locked On Giants podcast. My special guest is Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings as we're breaking down the Minnesota Vikings, whom the Giants see in week one. When we come back, more on the Vikings offense, and we'll turn to the defense, which lost one of its biggest players in the offseason free agency. So don't go anywhere. Hey, Giant fans, passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. And with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. So go on and keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply, eBay's guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. All right, Giant fans, welcome back to the Locked on Giants podcast. I'm your host, Patricia Trena, with special guest Luke Braun, host of Locked on Vikings, as we continue to break down the New York Giants 2024 regular season opponents, the Giants host the Vikings week one at MetLife Stadium, sporting their century red uniforms, which <laughs> is sort of a... a I love them. I love them. You I think they them. are great. I love them. I think the really? Giants whole kit is de- genuinely one of the best in the league. Okay. All right. I think it looks well, great. I think, I think people just don't like horizontal stripes on football. Uh, or like don't like thick horizontal like 
three stripes on football uniforms because they haven't seen it before. And it's a throwback to an era nobody's nostalgic for because they weren't alive and then they don't like it. I think that's all that's going on here. Well, I wasn't alive back then, but I do know that I don't like when the Giants jerseys are predominantly red. But that's just my my preference at any rate. But anyway, uh, Luke, getting back to the Vikings offense, you know, if they're like every other team, it seems like it's on the Giants schedule. There may be some questions about the offensive line. Would I be correct? As much as anybody has, but it's actually, we're pretty optimistic right now. There were a lot of questions going into last year because they ran back a group that struggled in 2022, and that group actually did fantastically. Christian Derrissaw and Brian O'Neill, bookend tackles. Derrissaw is coming to his own. Uh, Garrett Bradbury at center has at least found a way to be, like he was a real laughing stock in the Zimmer era. The Kevin O'Connell offense has, I think, made his job a little easier, and he's been doing better with that. They've got uh, Ed Ingram, who I think has come into his own. He's heading into his third year, and I think he's really developed into a a solid guard. And then left guard is the question. Right now they have Blake Brandle, who was a backup for his entire rookie contract, who now is just like getting the first job. Even though they signed Dalton Reisner, they've told Reisner he's a backup. And he's like, okay, I got to make my peace with that. But that is just a a straight-up flip in the depth chart that is, is raising a lot of eyebrows. So, you know, O-line, Chris, O-line coach Chris Cooper must really like him. We'll see how that goes. But honestly, that's, this game, uh, Brandle is probably the guy I'm going to be watching the most because he won't play at all in preseason. I'm going to be like, okay, what's the deal with this guy? Like, what, show me what you were seeing, and, and we'll see if he can uh, hang on to Dexter, hang on with uh, Dexter Lawrence, who I, I think is, now that Aaron Donald is out, in the conversation for the best D-tackle in the league. Yeah, he's going to be a load for anybody to handle, that's for sure. Yeah. I mean, how much does the offense change for the Vikings now that, you know, Cousins isn't there and you've got Darnold and or, you know, J.J. McCarthy? You know, does it change that much? I am so curious to see just what they change for Sam Darnold. Because O'Connell showed when we were doing QB carousel stuff last year, like a, a, a certain willingness to change the seeds of the offense, to change the whole framework of the offense on the fly around who is going to be quarterback. From drop back depths to play action versus not, shotgun versus under center. I mean, like founda- formational stuff, like the skeleton of the offense. And he was doing that in the middle of the season. So now that you have Sam Darnold, I'm curious to see what he what he designs uh, and what sort of what he prioritizes. Do we want quick dropbacks? Do we want longer dropbacks and deeper passes? Do we like what do we want to do here with Darnold, and how that works in with like JJ McCarthy eventually taking over as well? I I, I am so curious to see what we see, but I have no idea what it's going to be. I would be very surprised if it was exactly the same as what we had for Kirk Cousins, though. I, I, I don't, it's, it is kind of a bit of a question mark, which is the, the bummer about hitting the Vikings week one. Other than, you know, Jefferson and Addison, do the Vikings have in your mind enough to compete at the skill position players or are there's any particular areas that you're especially worried about? I, I think that might be their best group, honestly, if just like skills, like Aaron Jones, everybody's really excited about him. He does not look like he's lost a step at all, at least in OTAs. Uh, they won't have Hawkinson, so tight end, I guess you would you would. But they've got blockers at tight end, so it's not a, it's not a total wash. I think if you're gonna look at for a, a an opportunity to take the Vikings down, and the Vikings, are, I mean, they're not. I don't think a top twenty team this year, and that's okay. They're they're taking one off. Okay, everybody, look away. We're changing clothes. Uh, <laughs> but if you're gonna find the reason the Vikings falter, it's going to be on defense, especially up front on defense. They don't have the beef that they were famous for a few years ago. Um, their their secondary is still going to be kind of the same patchwork group with a lot of rotation and a lot of Brian Flores magic. It's still kind of going to be a roster that on paper looks really a- exploitable that just blitzes all the time. Good luck. You mentioned the defense, so let's pivot there. Uh, they lost Danielle Hunter in the mm-hmm. offseason, which was, a, I'm, I'm sure, a very big loss. And oh, yeah. know, even, even going back, you know, a couple of years ago when the Giants last saw the Vikings, there were some questions about that defensive secondary. Now, the Giants, of course, they've added Malik Neighbors to that receiver group. That receiver group wasn't that bad. Now they've got Neighbors in there, and the projection is it's going to be that much better. Are you concerned about the matchup, Giants offense versus the defense? And if so, where is the biggest concern for you on the Vikings defense? I mean, there's concerns everywhere 
on the Vikings defense. So I'm probably going to say yes to every game on the schedule to that question. Uh, so if you have neighbors, that probably means you want to go for like crossing stuff over the middle and hope you can get some like after catch stuff going. Right. So you're probably looking to get like the blitz counters there, but honestly, I don't know what kind of run game the, the giants are cooking up here or how you feel about that. But I do think that the Vikings can just get pounded up the middle. Uh, they have Harrison Phillips. I love Harrison Phillips. I think he's a fantastic nose, but he's only one guy. And I think is if you just kind of have your running back read and go into a different gap, uh, you're going to find an exploitable matchup with a lot of players that like, I mean, well, I'm not talking about like starters, but I feel mad about them. I think like everybody else has been cut at some point. Like it's a rough group in the middle there after Harrison Phillips, not to mention losing Daniel Hunter and his, um, just ha not having that game record. Now we're getting really excited about Dallas Turner, the rookie. Uh, he, he showed up at OTAs and everybody was like, Whoa, okay. We, we might have something here. We'll see. Got to put on the pads and actually do it in the trenches to really look, but he looks quick. So maybe there's something there. Um, the, but I also don't think that they're going to rush him onto the field either. So hitting the Vikings week one, you might get a rotational role for Dallas Turner, where later in the season he might be starting. They have Jonathan Grenard out of the Texans um, and Andrew Van Ginkle, who's who's a big Brian Flores guy. So they they it's it's again it's kind of patchwork. It's like a lot of players all rotating, keeping guys fresh, different personnel packages that presents its own challenge. But I the thing I struggle with is who on the defense wrecks your plan. It kind of feels like you can go do whatever you want to do on offense. And the thing that wrecks your plan is like blitzing. So if you can handle blitzing, you can kind of just go be whoever you want to be. And there's no guy where you're like, ah, shoot, we can't do that. He's over there. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you look at this matchup and I know the rosters aren't set or anything like that, but how are you feeling about this giants Vikings with one matchup? Are you, concerned do you think that they match up evenly and again i know that some positions still need to be settled but yeah, overall. yeah um i don't know what to expect except for the fact that this game doesn't have any playoff implications <laughs> it just feels like a well, we can just forget this one probably like this is what i'm gonna say on all the crossovers this year it's like everyone just look away from the vikings for a year please <laughs> We're we're training the rookie quarterback. We're doing a Sam Darnold year. We've got like transition stuff going on at a whole bunch of different positions. We're this is a wardrobe change year, okay? We just we close the curtain. Everyone look away. Go pay attention to somebody else for a year. Uh, but I think anything can happen. I mean, Sam Darnold, truly anything can happen. I think it's going to be another very chaotic year. A lot of turnovers, maybe both ways, right? Blitzing on defense, you know, crazy stuff going on on offense. So I don't know. Maybe it'll be good TV, but I truly have no idea what to expect. You're so honest. I love it. <laughs> All right, Giant fans. We'll be right back with more from Luke Braun as we wrap up this Minnesota Vikings preview. Minnesota Vikings week one for the New York Giants in 2024. We'll be right back after this. All right, Giant fans. Welcome back to Locked On Giants. I'm your host, Patricia Trainer, with special guest Luke Braun, host of Locked On Vikings. And Luke, before you mentioned uh, Brian Flores, I think this is his second season mm -hmm. uh, as the defensive coordinator. How do you anticipate Flores maybe tweaking that defense a little bit, you know, now that he's lost a few pieces, he's gained a few pieces, and he knows the personnel a lot better than he did maybe this time last year? This is the funnest question about the Vikings to me, because I have no idea, and we are in very uncharted waters with Flores. What he did last year has never been done in the NFL. Um, we've had blitz-heavy defenses in the NFL. You had Wink Martindale, right? You you remember. Uh, Wink has been doing that kind of thing for forever. Lots of Belichick defenses have been doing it. Flores himself has been doing it forever. But you would always have man coverage behind the blitz. When you would blitz, you would not do zone coverage, right? Because somebody's going to be vacating a zone, and quarterbacks are too good, and they can find it. Flores took some ideas from Pat Narduzzi, who's at Pitt, uh, and combined them with some stuff that he was already a part of his package from his Belichick years and essentially created coverages that actually work with the blitzes. Doing three deep, three under, or two deep, three under, depending on how many people are there. Having, I mean, they were still exploitable zones. You have five guys in zone coverage. There's going to be a hole somewhere. But he was able to sort of pair those with 
um, in, in like a very college defense sort of way with zones that were really hard, especially for young quarterbacks to figure out. So you had this stretch where Justin Fields was just totally stumped. Aiden O'Connell gets shut out. I mean, you got this stretch of like five games where they were the best defense in the league and it wasn't close. And then you got some smarter offenses. You got Zach Taylor and the Bengals. You got the Lions twice. You got Jordan Love and Matt LaFleur and the Packers. Um, And they sort of figured it out, figured out where the holes were and how to exploit them how to design a game plan specifically for the Vikings. Now, I, I think it's good to be the team that you have to completely design something else for. Uh, and I, I think they like left left it there. You know, that's why they didn't make any major uh, changes in, down the stretch. But they did lose four in a row to, to end the season. Uh, so I am very curious to see if Flores, A, just sort of tries to patch over those holes and put the holes somewhere else and make people design new stuff on the fly. Or B just goes back to what he called when he was at Miami and when he was at New England, which worked very well anyways, and going back to a more familiar version of it, or do we like sail deeper into the uncharted ocean? I'm very curious. I am as well. Now, Luke, again, I know it's still weeks away. You got to finalize the 90, uh, the 53 man roster. But that being said, what do you think is going to give the giants the most trouble outside of maybe Jefferson and, and, and Addison, what what aspect are we not really talking about that we should be worried about if, if we're the Giants? I'm hesitant to, to hype up Aaron Jones too much because he's, I mean, he's older, he's been hurt a lot and stuff, but week one, that's not real, like that's a fatigue and an injury thing, you know, that stuff shows up in October and November. Week one, I would say the Aaron Jones run game. Um, look, you have Dexter Lawrence, so that's always going to be, it's never going to be like that. That'll have an impact. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's especially if you're going to be living in too high because you're afraid of just Jefferson and Addison, which is how the giants approached Jefferson both games last time. And Addison wasn't in the building yet. Um, so if you're going to do the too high thing again, which is kind of what I would expect, then that means you're going to have minus boxes. That means you're going to have like slightly less stuff. And much like I was talking about with Harrison Phillips, Dexter Lawrence is only one guy. He can only occupy two gaps uh, that there's more gaps than that. So I think that run game with, with Aaron Jones could be the thing. Now O'Connell has never had a good run game in either of his two years. He's also kind of been a guy that likes to pass 45 times a game. Cause he doesn't really care about the run game. So, that could be like a surprising narrative we see all seasons. Like, oh, he's whoa, Kevin O'Connell. He's like committing to the run all of a sudden because everybody's like backing everything off and trying to take the you know cap the top of the defense. And we go, okay, then we're just going to run it down your down your throat. I would love to see that, uh, but there's also just it's Aaron Jones. There's an explosiveness to his game that can always just like take a second and twelve situation. And oh my god, he just like you know housed it. Like that can happen. So I, I, I'm excited about that, but I do think like the, the answer is Justin Jefferson. It's always going to be Justin Jefferson. <laughs> yeah. But of course, you know, with the Giants, you mentioned the, the run game last year, the Giants had their trouble against the run. So hmm. it could, you know, we'll, we'll see. It should be better this year, but uh, you never know. All it takes is one injury and I'm not, yeah. not hoping, you know, obviously I don't want to see anybody get hurt on the Giants, but you never know what might pop up. Luke, Great stuff. I appreciate you coming on. He is Luke Braun, host of Locked On Vikings, the Giants, and Vikings swear off week one in the 2024 regular season at MetLife, Century Red Jerseys and all, which Luke is obviously happy I love, I'm so excited. I'm down. I'm game. <laughs> you must. I, I can just see the comments now. They're going to be like, what is he smoking? Them? That he likes those red jerseys. But anyway. I like him and everyone else is wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Oh, it's the strongest take I have. He is not afraid to state his opinions. There you have it. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the Locked On Giants podcast. Thank you all so much for spending time with us today. And please check out our other Locked On podcasts. We have NFL, we have MLB, NHL, NBA, we've got college. All the hosts do such a fantastic job. And they're really good people, folks. As you can see, they've got senses of humor like Luke does. Uh, and yes, he's, he's, he's actually, I think he's serious about those red jerseys, but anyway. Oh, I'm dead serious. I think they rock. <laughs> All right. Well, for Luke Broad, I'm Patricia Chena. Thank you, Giant fans, and I'll catch you tomorrow. 